Good morning and welcome to worship at Greendale People's Church. We are so grateful and thankful that you have welcomed us into your hearts and into your homes this morning. During worship today, we celebrate an open communion, which means everybody is welcome to join in this wonderful feast. I invite you now to go to your pantry and get a, a cookie, cracker, donut, some bread, maybe some juice, coffee, tea, whatever you have on hand, so that you'll have it available so later in worship when we celebrate communion, we can all join in this great feast together. For now, I invite you to center your hearts as we prepare for worship and listen to this beautiful prelude from our music minister, Annie Arsenal. She 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the earth became chaos and emptiness, and darkness came over the face of the deep. Yet the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Light be. And light was. God saw that light was good. And God separated light from darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. Evening came and morning followed the first day. Please join us in our opening song, All Creatures of Our God and King, by our music minister, Annie Arsenal. We are a people of prayer, and so at this time I invite you now, if you're watching us through Facebook Live, to share your prayers. You can enter them in the chat on the side of your screen, or at any time during the week you can go to our website, greendalepeopleschurch.org, and there's a place where you can share your prayers, or you can send an email to our care ministry, careministry at greendalepeopleschurch.org. Today, we continue to hold in our hearts and our prayers all of the healthcare workers and the first responders, the retail workers and the truck drivers, the farmers and food workers, as well as our civic leaders who continue to try to inform us as best they can to help us to navigate the challenging circumstances that we face so that we together may continue to create a more healthy, more loving, more just community, city, and world. We hold in our hearts all of those who are grieving, who are ill, who are struggling with illnesses of the mind, the body, and the spirit, those who are facing economic uncertainty and all other kinds of challenges on this day. Let us join together then in the spirit of prayer. Creator God, you are an incredible God 
and we give you thanks for this beautiful, wonderful day that you have made. You have showered and poured out your love upon all creation. For that we say thank you. We give you thanks for the friends, the families, and the strangers in whose love and care for us we feel and experience the kind of love that you have for each one of us as your children. And we know even as we give thanks to you that there are those in our community, our city, our world, who are grieving, struggling, who are even dying. And so we ask that they may continue to feel the power of your healing Holy Spirit, that they may continue to believe and know that you are making a way even when there seems to be no way. We know that you hear our prayers, whether they are spoken or unspoken. And so now we pause that you may listen deeply to the prayers that are deep within our hearts on this day. Creator God, we are assured that you work in and through all things for love because you came to us in the one, your Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, who while he was here taught us this prayer that together we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. So justice for yourself. Reap the fruits of unfailing love and break your unplowed ground. Now is the time to seek God until the reins of justice fall upon you. Don't think I've come to abolish the law and prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The truth is, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter of the law, not even the smallest part of the letter, will be done away with until all is fulfilled. That's why whoever breaks the least significant of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever fulfills and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your sense of justice surpasses that of the religious scholars and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven.
whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever it is that you're feeling today and at this particular time, no matter how isolated or lost or alone, if you're somebody who's in re recovery and are struggling because of this time of, of physical separation, I want to reassure you that one, God is with you, that God loves you, that no matter how small or insignificant you may feel, that you are incredibly loved, you have a purpose to your life, that God is with you and for you and guides you and protects you, and that that's what our stories and these stories are all about. There was a time in my life, actually not that long ago, um, several years ago, in conversation with a spiritual director, I was struggling. I was facing a period of time where, where I was experiencing many, many frustrations. Um, I was wondering about my purpose, about my call, about um, whether or not I was making any difference. I was, quite frankly, feeling pretty tired, pretty lost, very alone and really, really small. Under the advisement of my spiritual director, he encouraged me to find a retreat. Not, not just a, an hour or three hour or a one day retreat, but, but to actually take time out of all of the busyness, of all of the things that were distracting me, all of the little things that were making me feel so small, and to go away and make sure that I made time for the most important of the most important things. That, he explained, was about my relationship with myself, how I was in relationship with others, and most importantly of all, my relationship found with creation and especially with our Creator. I searched and it took me many, many months to actually find a retreat that met my calendar and schedule and also seemed to be of interest. And so eventually the time came and I went away and I was at the Mercy Center um, just outside of San Francisco. It was a week long retreat. There were periods of, of silence of all things. And for the most part, for the first few days, I didn't feel like anything was happening or that there was any change. I was still feeling kind of disconnected and incredibly frustrated. And one morning I rose early, very early. I walked the grounds just before the sun was coming up and I just started going over in my heart and in my mind, where was I? Who was I? Who am I because of who God is? I can't explain how it happened, but there's a particular energy that you feel in the beginning of the day. When night recedes and the first rays of the sun begin to break through the deepness and the darkness of the night. Little by little, the birds began to sing. It was like the skies began to open. The sun's rays played with the shadows of the stones and the trees and the objects in the garden. I sat down on a bench and just sat there quietly. Little by little, and I can't explain how, but all of the fear and all of the frustration just began to break away. And to my surprise, the words from Julian of Norwich began to accompany me. Julian lived many years ago, and it was actually about this time of year, early May, 1373, in the time of the plague, the Black Plague in Europe. She became very ill. She was 30 years old at the time, she says. She became incredibly ill. And as she lay there, nearly lifeless, her life slipping away. These words came to her. All is well. And all is well. And in all matters, all things will be well. 
I rose, reassured, remembering those words and the power of her vision. Reassured that being who God created me to be, that doing my best to be the expression of God's love was exactly what God was calling me to do and to be in this time, as imperfect as I may be, as challenging as it may be, to use the time that I have, not just at that retreat, but the time that I have here on earth to make sure that I am always making time, setting aside time for the most important of things. Sure, there'll be busyness and unimportant things, but we need to really work to make sure that the little things that make us feel little do not crowd out the big things, making time to be reassured of who we are because of who God is and how much God truly loves us and with us and is for us and is there to guide and provide and protect us, come what may. For me, that is what these stories are all about. It's what Jesus, I think, was really trying to do on that day when he calls the disciples away and the crowds begin to gather around. Remember, these are people who, in that time and in that society, because of who they were, were made to feel really small. Remember how he begins his Sermon on the Mount? First, he reassures them, y'all are already blessed. God has blessed you because of who you are. Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who grieve the loss of the way the world was, the brokenness, the unjust ways of the world, the unloving ways of the world. Don't let them get in the way of who God has called you to be or who God is needing you to be on this particular day. And then he reminds them, remember? Each and every one of you have been created for a purpose. You are salt and you are light in a city on the world. You have a purpose that God has created you for in order for God's love to shine in you and to come out through you, for you to use your presence to preserve the good, to light the way for those who are lost on the journey, to create the place of refuge and hospitality for all who feel lost and alone. And then, he helps to remind them of who he is and why he's there. He gets this, and, and I get this, and we even see this in our time. There are so many people who right now are trying to adhere either to the letter of the law, or some who are questioning the spirit of the law, and some who just want to obliterate the whole thing. Live free or die, the signs say. Well, it's really more like live free and die or live free and cause someone else to die. Anarchy is not the answer to our frustrations. Those times when we are made to feel small, either because things don't make us comfortable or because we have to sacrifice our freedoms and our liberties in order to create a more loving, more healthy, more just, and more safe community. Sure, we'd all like to have worship. We'd all like to gather together in community. But right now, it isn't safe. And so, what Jesus does on that particular day, these people who feel small, there are some who are gathered there who just want to overthrow it all, who see within him the hope of the prophecies, that he is the Messiah, the long-awaited king. And, and, and he knows that there are those who have their own political agendas. There are those who want anarchy. And he reminds them, I'm, I'm not here to obliterate the law. I'm here to fulfill it. I'm here to bring life into it. And then he does and he says the most amazing things. I'm not going to get rid of even the smallest dot, the tiniest of letters, the iota, the tiniest little letter. I'm not going to get rid of any of it. I'm here to fulfill all of it. It is the difference between adhering to each letter of the law and bringing life's spirit into the law, like embodying it, helping us to understand what it really was meant to mean. The law, when he talks about the law, what he's really talking about is the first five books of what we consider the Old Testament, beginning with Genesis. 
It is the Torah, the, the books of Moses. And then he says the prophets. Well, the prophets are, are, are all of the writings of the individuals in whom and through whom God continues to speak. The, the people who throughout Israel's history reminded the people when they had lost their way of who they were and of who God was calling them to be. Remember what he says eventually. The greatest commandment is to love one another. Love! That's what it is all about. But he goes further than that. He says even the tiniest, the smallest of all of God's commands will not slip away until heaven and earth pass. But I am here to fulfill it, to bring life into it. I think for those who are feeling really small, like a little dot on a letter, somebody who is feeling really insignificant and marginalized by society of that time, by the unloving things that other people have said, I think for him to say that, that he cares so much that not even that tiny little dot is going to slip away is also a reminder of how big and grand and great God's love is. No matter how small or insignificant you may be feeling, God is there with you and for you and loves you all the same. When he talks about the least of the commandments, it's a curious thing. But, but, but here's the thing for me, as I go back and I think about this, I, I go back to the, the visions of Julian of Norwich. Julian actually became the first woman author of an English text, 1300s. When she was there lying on her deathbed, she said she was 30 years old, her, 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 she had fever, she had illness, they weren't sure if it was the plague or what it was, like so many these days. She said, by the third day, they came in and they gave her the last rites. By the sixth day, her body was failing and they were preparing her for the end, her final transition and journey. And then, as she was preparing to let go, she said she had this incredible burning desire that she wanted to continue to hold on to life. She said, God, Lord, I love you so much. I want to live out that love in ways that are even more amazing than they could be with you in heaven. And she says that it was there in that morning of the seventh day, she had this powerful vision. She said, I saw the Lord and He came to me and He was holding in the palm of His hand something small and round, like, like a hazelnut. She said, what, what might that be? And she said, she felt in her spirit that she had the answer almost instantly. It is all that is and ever was, all of creation held in the palm of God's hand. How tiny and insignificant she thought it was. She said, I, I thought that it would just fade away. And then she said, she heard in her spirit, God speaking deeply to her. God created it and God loves it. And because of this, it will never slip away. And then she said, I felt that there were three important properties about this in all of creation. No matter how tiny and small that it was, she said, I was assured that God created it. And then I knew that even in its insignificance in how small it, it, it felt, God loved it. And then I was absolutely assured that God would provide and protect and ensure that it would survive. You know, the first of the commands, the law, if you will, the first commandment that God gives 
is there in the very beginning, the opening chapter of Genesis, the very first words. In the beginning it says, God created all that was, made the heaven and the earth. God created everything in the beginning. And in and, and there, it was emptiness, a void, a deepness, but an emptiness, no life within all of creation. It says, God's Spirit brewed across the water. God's Spirit. You can imagine that as God's breath, God's Spirit, God's essence, God's being. Some say the holy dove, but hovered across the emptiness of the deep in the waters. And then God said, light be. Let there be light. It's like the first, the smallest, maybe even the most insignificant of all of God's commands happens there in the beginning. Light be. Out of darkness and emptiness comes light. And then from that, there is a place that is made for love and life to thrive. It is what all of our time is about, no matter how small or insignificant you may be. It is to push aside all of the things, the people in this world that are making you feel so small so that you may be the amazing person that God has created and called you to be. The prophet Hosea says, look, it's time to seek God right where you're at. Sow the seeds, break the fallow ground, break new ground in this time. In this time when we are separated, let us make time so that we can go deeper and be who it is that God is calling us to be together. You are not insignificant. You are more powerful than you could ever imagine. For in you and through you is God's love and God's light. That God is with you wherever you are on the journey. That God is there to guide you and to provide you. The law and the prophets we are told through the Apostle Paul, they were there until Jesus actually came to embody them and to live in them and to bring new life to us through them. And those laws in the prophet Jesus himself sums up to say they are all summed up in this. Love one another. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. For me, we find the fullness of life when we bring new life into love. Loving ourselves for who we are. Loving others no matter how different or how disturbing or diseased they may make us. Finding new relationship to love God's creation. And then making time for the most important of the important things. To find ways to express God's love in loving God, our neighbor and ourself. May God continue to guide you and to protect you and to remind you of how important and how loved you have been created to be. Amen.
Our God is an amazing God. Even in this time of physical separation, God is continuing to connect us and guide us so that we can be this community that God is really calling us to be. The old world is being swept away. I don't know what this new world is going to be. We're talking about what is it going to look like when we come back together again. We need your input. We need your prayers and we need your presence. So we thank you for joining us in online worship. I also really would encourage you to join us if you're watching us on Facebook Live for our Zoom virtual coffee time, which actually happens immediately following our worship service around 10.45 or 10.50 each Sunday. On May 17th, we're gonna have very special virtual coffee time around 10.45, 10.50, right after virtual worship service. We invite you, everybody, to join together for an important Zoom conversation, one so that we can see and talk to each other. Um, if, you, if you don't have internet connectivity or webcam, you can just call in and listen in. Um, but if you do have a webcam, we encourage you to, to, to sign on to the Zoom so that we can see your smiling faces. Um, but on May 17th in particular, on that particular Sunday, we are actually going to be presenting a, a lot of updates about where we are on this journey, about um, our, our thinking, um, about reopening and how do we actually reemerge and phase back into um, physical connection um, when we're able to do that. We're also going to have an update about the, the vision that has emerged, Love in Action, from our Team TLC, an update about the Pastoral Search Team, an update from the board who has been very, very busy starting to get their mind around some really big questions in our life and for our future. So I really encourage you, if you are able, to make time, especially on May 17th, to join us for our virtual coffee coffee time. There'll be more information coming out about that and if you're not able to join us for that conversation we will be recording it and posting it um, on Facebook as well as on our YouTube channel. We are so grateful to the number of individuals who are so dedicated to this community and this congregation that even in this time of physical distancing, you continue to give your gifts so that we may continue to support our ministries. To everybody who, who stops by on Wednesdays or throughout the week to, to give us donations for a food pantry, to our food pantry volunteers, such a critical ministry and it continues even in these challenging times. And so thank you so much. Our treasurer tells us that our giving is actually up about 5% from what we had anticipated in our budget. And that is incredibly good news. And that's because of the dedication of so many of you. So thank you, thank you for everybody who is able to and has continued to give your gifts so that we can keep this ministry vibrant and strong. If you're able to, we do encourage you to give online. You can go to greendalepeopleschurch.org and there's a, a, a menu item for giving. Um, you can mail your gifts to the, ch to the church and that's Greendale People's Church, 25 Francis Street in Worcester, Massachusetts. You can also stop by the church and there's a mailbox on the Francis Street side and, and you can just tuck your, your gifts um, into the mailbox there um, if you would like to do that as well. If you have any questions at any time or if you're feeling isolated alone or just want to talk to somebody or chat, send an email to careministry at greendalepeopleschurch.org or feel free to send me an email, revkev at greendalepeopleschurch.org if you have any questions or if there's any way that we can try to connect you in ways that make sense. Speaking of connecting in ways that make sense, we continue to encourage people to create content and to engage and connect with, with our youth, with our elders, with people on the internet through Facebook Live and through Zoom. If you're the leader of a ministry team, we really encourage you to schedule a meeting. We will help you to set that up um, on Zoom so that, that our ministries can continue to actually plan for what activities we might be doing in, in the rest of May, June, July, August, throughout the summer, as well as continued planning for 125 um, year anniversary celebrations. At this time, we're preparing in order to celebrate this great feast that we call communion. It is for some the Lord's Supper. It is the great feast of Thanksgiving when we are reminded of how big God's love is for each and every one of us. That night when Christ gathered with the disciples, that night when he was betrayed. So if you haven't had a chance to do so, I do encourage you to go and, and quickly grab a piece of toast, bread, cracker, cookie, tea, coffee, juice, whatever you have on hand so that we may bless and celebrate this great feast together.
My friends, let us begin to prepare ourselves, our hearts, and our minds to join together through God's Holy Spirit in this great feast. May the Lord be with you. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is always right to give thanks to God, for God is the God who created everything, you and me and all of creation, who broods and cares for all of creation so much that God's love pours out over into and through all that has been created. It's just an amazing thing. We remember that even on the night when Christ was betrayed, he met with the disciples. There were those who were there who would deny him, those who had already betrayed him. And yet, he met with them. They celebrated a great feast. He took the bread from the table. He blessed it, gave thanks to God. And then, he broke it open the same way I believe as he broke open his life. Take and eat, he said, for this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For me, it's like he's saying, let this become a part of you and you a part of me and we can participate in God's great ministry of love for all of creation together. Let us be this body that embodies God's loving presence here on earth. And then, in like manner, after the meal, he took the cup and he blessed it. He gave thanks to God. And then he passed it to everyone who was there and saying, take and drink for this cup contains the new covenant that flows in and through my blood. It is given and shed for each and all of you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. It's like he's saying, there isn't anything that you could do or say that will get between you and God's love or forgiveness. I mean, there were those that were already, that had betrayed him. And he said, you're forgiven. There were those who he said, you're going to deny me. And they were forgiven. So everyone, everyone is forgiven. Don't let that get in the way or be one of these things that make you feel small. If there's something that, that you forgot to do or you didn't do or that you feel that you should do or haven't said or should have said or shouldn't have said, don't let that get in the way of seeking forgiveness and offering graceful forgiveness, of knowing, of knowing that you too are loved for who you are and have the power of that love and light deep within you. Creator God, we come to you on this beautiful day and we ask that you bless, that you bless all of these different and diverse elements that we have gathered. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, make us one as you make humanity one. Transform them as you have transformed grain of the field and grape of the vine, transform them and transform us that we may be your healing nourishment for our hurting world. We ask these things in your many names. Amen. So my friends, I invite you to take, eat, and drink, and do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ who came to us to show us that God's way is always the way of the most important of important things and that is love. Creator God, we thank you. We thank you for, for making this time and making this space, for gathering us through the, this amazing modern technology and through the power of your Holy Spirit. 
We ask that you continue to work in us and through us, that you transform us, that you help us to find ways to push away all of the busyness and all of the things that make us feel so small, that we may make time and space for the most important of the most important things, your grace, your love, your forgiveness. In all your many names we say, Amen. Great.